All right, happy Friday, everyone. Happy Friday. Okay, one, one more time, one more time. Happy Friday. Okay, right on, right on. There we go. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we are here for this moment uh, to have a dialogue about getting past the noise, novel communication strategies for vaccination, health literacy, and social change. So joining me uh, today are Scott Ratson, Tanya Shu, and Lauren Swan Patras. So in a moment, I will uh, give each, each of us a moment to introduce ourselves. Uh, and I want you to know also that we will uh, appreciate your questions so we can enhance this dialogue, all right? So we'll do a little conversation on what we will pretend will be our sofa. So welcome to our living room and we're just gonna talk, okay? All right, so uh, if we'll begin with Scott, if you would just tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll proceed to your left. Great, and it's, um, it's great to be back at, a, at an Emerson event. I just tried to realize that it was 36 years ago when I first went to Emerson uh, for my master's and um, over the, the journey in um, different fields from both academia and private sector and government here in Washington at USAID and then over in, in Brussels. And now, uh, as Greg did a very quick mention, I'm at the City University of New York Graduate School of Public Health and um, still maintain my faculty pieces with Boston at Tufts uh, Medical School, uh, also St. Andrews Medical School, and um, have been fortunate also to be linked with Columbia, all with health communication as the central theme. So uh, I edited the Journal of Health Communication, started at Emerson 27 years ago while I was there, 1994, so it's been a long time. and I. I there's only one person in the room I can acknowledge who's still on the original editorial board, and that's Gregory Payne, the chair, who's a support <laughs> um, for all those years as well. Uh, and anyway, there's a long introduction. I'm really excited about why I um, really enjoy being in academia is to create opportunities for great people, some of whom have been students who I saw last evening. Uh, some of them might still be in the audience, and then two of our well, one a recent grad and one a near recent grad in our health communication for social change program. So over to you, Lauren. Hello, my name, oh, wow, it's loud. My name is Lauren. Um, like Scott said, I'm a recent grad of the um, Health Communication for Social Change program at uh, CUNY SPH. Uh, my background is in theater and storytelling. I was a New York-based actor for about 16 years. Uh, I'm now in Los Angeles, uh, where I'm from, and I'm really interested in the intersection of storytelling and narrative and public health messaging. Um, as we'll discuss later, I think that it is, we're at a time with great opportunity where we can really invest in um, innovative communication techniques that employ storytelling and, and narrative. So that's a little bit about me. It's great to be here. Hi, I'm Tan, Ooh. I'm Tan Jashub. Um, as Scott mentioned, I'm a near graduate. I'll be, I'm in my final semester in the Health Communication for Social Change program that he co-directs. Um, I have worked in various capacities over the years in medical and scientific publishing. So I was a journal editor. I'm now a medical writer and editor. And uh, we'll see what happens in a couple of months after I get this degree. Mm -hmm. All right, great, thank you. And just very briefly about myself. So I'm Brent Smith, uh, currently serving as interim dean of Emerson College's School of Communication, where I'm pleased to note on this topic we have two new majors. Uh, coming next year, one being health and social change, the other media psychology. Uh, so I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Gregory Payne for uh, making sure that good things like this continue to happen. So thank you so much, Greg. So let's just kind of get into a little conversation. Uh, you know, during uh, COVID, we uh, went through a lot and we're probably still processing, still unpacking what exactly we went through, and it's technically not fully over, but um, what happened? What's the story? Uh, what did we learn? What might we do better as it relates to communicating with the people who um, maybe needed some convincing that this was a real thing and that they could do something about it for themselves? Well, let um, I me mean, thank the dean for the introduction and going to one of the terms that we came up with, convincing, and I'll, I'll get back to that. So uh, I thought when I was listening this morning uh, to uh, other panels and the, the keynote, there's a lot of fatigue that's going on in the world right now. There's a lot of frustration. 
And if I said we're doing a panel on COVID, it's a lot of COVID fatigue too. Uh, there are a couple of people wearing masks, but not that we all need to wear masks anymore. The president said it was, it's over. Um, it's not over. Uh, we actually are part of a, a consensus panel that was just uh, published yesterday in Nature, which is getting a lot of press of what we need to do. But there was get a little bit of background. Um, so it was March of um, 2020. I was driving in from Princeton to New York to go to CUNY for a, um, a discussion on health literacy. And I gave Spencer a call on the way and said, Spencer, you know, this is, this is going to get out of control. Uh, on March 3rd, we had published an article calling for a coordinated trusted source of communication that was necessary. We published it in the National Academy of Medicine's Perspectives. I say we, I did it with another, um, I'm on the board of Global Health there, another board member from Georgetown, professor at USC, professor at um, uh, Emory. And we said, we know what we need to do. And is this going to be in Washington? Is this going to be in Atlanta? Is this going to be in Geneva? Is it going to be in London? We needed a coordinated trusted source. Fast forward, we didn't get that. We republished that article. It became the top five article, but for those of you in publishing field as well as those of us that publish, right? What we publish doesn't always turn into action. So I call Spencer and I say, Spencer, you know, this is going to be a public health, this is not only a public health emergency of international concern, it's going to be a pandemic. A week later it became a, a pandemic on March the 10th and what was it? March 13th I think we had the first survey fielded in New York with, um, with Spencer. Uh, uh, expertise in Emerson polling. We started publishing results and we said, gosh, this is important enough that we're getting, this is the epicenter, New York was the epicenter. So every week we were doing surveys. Who do people trust? What are they doing? There was no vaccine on the horizon yet. Uh, and we, we published, but we published it quickly. It was, we did a press, we, what we fielded on Friday, Sunday we'd go over it, Monday we'd do a, a media release. And, and I think um, Spencer did a, a fabulous job and, and it helped move Emerson polling, not only what they could do in New York, we did deep dives in Harlem, I think was mentioned before, and I know you did the Mandarin, and the, we've done a lot of different ones. Uh, metropolitan, four metropolitan areas in 23 countries. We've published twice, we're gonna have a third iteration in these 23 countries. So we've got a lot of data, and I think what you wanna hear about, data everywhere in a nobody, nobody in charge world, where has it led us? And I'm sort of paraphrasing Harlan Cleveland who said that at the end of last century on data everywhere and who's in charge. So what more can we do? So we published these surveys. We then created something called Convince, which was a COVID new vaccine information, communication, and education. Used these surveys, launched it at the United Nations at a high level political forum. And we started to get people to have dialogues. We did these dialogues, but people were getting frustrated, right? Dialogues are okay, but what do we do? And we did the surveys that showed that people weren't gonna get vaccinated. But people, if I point to Bethesda or I point to the White House, whatever, they thought, oh yeah, once there's a vaccine, everybody will get vaccinated. Well, we knew that wouldn't happen. We had data. We had surveys. We knew, we also did qualitative research. We did focus groups. People weren't gonna just trust something that was sped up. Calling something warp speed wasn't a good idea either. And you know, frankly, there was not a lot of trust in the government, in the last government. And frankly, unfortunately, it's chipping away at the current government. So this is a long answer of what we could do for communication. And we have a health communication for social change program. We have a journal, we've even, I, I, uh, we, had a, we did a whole special issue on vaccine communication in a pandemic. Uh, and not our data, we had, you know, Annenberg School had their data on reaching uh, black populations, the challenges that they found. We had the churches at Hopkins where they were trying to reach, uh, our people at Hopkins are writing about the church work in Baltimore. We had stuff from all around, actually Central Asia with UNICEF. And frankly, to answer the question, there's no magic bullet, right? There's no answer. And the United States, whether you want to believe it or not, if you think we have the best health system in the world, you're wrong, right? You know where we are on infant mortality at 27th. Uh, we're not great on maternal mortality. And if you think we did a great job with COVID, you're wrong because we have a higher per capita death than anywhere else. So over a million people were lost who shouldn't have been lost, many of them, for mistakes we made early on of not getting people vaccinated in nursing homes, not having the right communication messages, and so forth. So it's easy to go back and be the quarterback, and I guess we're gonna do that next Wednesday with Spencer, uh, or maybe next Thursday after we get the results from Pennsylvania and Georgia. Um, but I guess the point is, is that um, I'm not as confident that what we've been doing will work. So I'm in a school of public health now. I think health communication programs, most of them have been in schools of communication. Um, 
actually I've seeded three programs in schools of public health, but communication is the element that's really key. And I think what we have tried to do, which is why I want to talk less and have the real experts speak, is that we thought, okay, you can do all the campaigns you want. And Tanja has been working on an analysis of the 15 major campaigns that were done from the Ad Council, $15 million to um, some local ones. And we're, we hope to publish that soon. And we know communication campaigns work, but they work for this much. So we try to come up with a new idea. It's not so new for those of you in communication, the use of narrative, use of storytelling, use of dialogue. And we built beyond this convince idea. We have the business partners to convince. We have a variety of groups. We have training modules. We, we've done the stuff that works. I'm not saying that doesn't work. But if you look where we are in vaccines in this country right now, we're not where we should be. And there very well could be another spike that happens in the next number of months. So I wouldn't be so confident. I don't think we're at a place now where this will be a super spreader event. But I do think we will have more things that will happen in our lifetimes and probably in the short term. So we try to put something that we think could be sustainable. And I'm going to turn it over to Lauren to speak more. And I'll, I know she's got a lot of examples. Um, but the idea was the use of narrative. So I'm going to just turn it over to Lauren to talk about why narrative, also why she got attracted to our Health Communication for Social Change program. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more and hopefully have more of a dialogue. This has been my, my long piece, so I know I was supposed to be on a, a couch in You're the very novel, in a novel style. style. But I, I, I have no trouble criticizing, even in Washington. Uh, but also at the same time, you know, knowing, working with, um, with Spencer, Emerson Poling, and you know, uh, all the people, uh, I think there's a lot we can do. So, okay. uh, sure, so um, yeah, so my interest is the intersection of public health and storytelling and narrative. Um, I got interested in, um, in this program at the beginning of the pandemic when I realized, you know, I was, I was seeing how messaging was not, we were falling behind. I felt like public health messaging has been trying to play catch up in the context of, of COVID-19. Um, so what I have, what I, I feel that public health messaging historically has relied on data and facts. It's been both dry and general, and it's not getting people, and it's not um, appealing to the humanity of, of the situation. So I think that's where storytelling and narrative can come, can come in. Uh, you know, two, um, speaking to a room of communicators, you know, two important elements of storytelling are identification and transportation. So when you, as an audience member, are able to identify with the narrator or the environment or the circumstances, it hits on a different level. And so I think that, that we had a great opportunity with COVID messaging to tell specific stories that were specific to communities uh, to not only share that health information, but also model the health behavior. Um, and so that's where Big Shots comes in. Uh, Big Shots was started in 2021, we launched with a national award show. It was run by graduate students at CUNY and then faculty and staff. Uh, I was a student and now I'm um, technically on staff. I forgot to mention I'm the managing editor of Scott's journal, Journal of Health Communication. Um, so Big Shot started as an opportunity to share and celebrate the works of everyday heroes, we call them big shots, in various communities, and amplify what they were doing. Give an example of um, work, incredible work that they were doing without being called upon um, in, in their specific communities. So we started this campaign with a national award show, and then we rely on peer nominations um, for people to nominate a big shot in their, in their community. Um, we are social media based, which means that it is, uh, re the overhead is relatively low. So we think that this could be a great opportunity for other public health issues that you can take this Big Shots method and uh, implement it based on, a, on the community's needs. My, did I answer the question? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I guess if you could kind of take us through, um, you know, why Big Shots? So I think some of the complaints we heard out of various communities, especially uh, underrepresented communities, was that uh, the people doing the talking weren't doing much listening and probably didn't have an idea about how to articulate or even where to deliver mm -hmm. the message, the timing, the channel, on and on and on. So um, how might you maybe help us understand what is a big shot? Sure, sure. So right. there's, you know, research that storytelling and narrative can help reach, uh, can help 
with hard to reach communities or communities have higher levels of hesitance or, or uh, resistance. And so big shots, we identified them through news sources and then we rely on peer uh, nominations, but it's people who are doing work relative or within the context of their community. So we saw you know, big shots from across the country doing, going door to door and sharing information about COVID-19, uh, helping communities with lower digital literacy or access to book uh, vaccination appointments. Uh, I'll give an example that we discussed earlier. There is this amazing 15-year-old kid in Northern California, his name is, Ar his name is Arn Parsa. And he started an organization called Teens for Vaccines, which was really fascinating because it's uh, policy focused. So here's this 15 year old kid who, through witnessing the story of another teenager who wasn't vaccinated, he started this organization to really uh, support policy where teens could get in charge of their, their vaccines. And so that was a big shot because relative to his community, teenagers, he did this incredible work to help spread, uh, spread the word and, and advocate for, um, for teen, teen vaccinations. So he was a big shot, you know. We had, we had another big shot who, um, she was a retired nurse and she volunteered for one of the first trials for the vaccine because she knew that within her community there was a lot of hesitancy. So she, she took it upon herself to volunteer and discuss why she volunteered and why she wanted to represent her community in, in these trials. So, you know, a big shot, their work is relative to their community, which is why it's so important that they sh share their story and not an outside organization say, you know, look at how great this person is, but this person actually gets to be recognized by their peers and, okay. and their peers say, you did a great thing. Great, great. Thanks for sharing that. You know, what comes to mind uh, for me as, as a marketer, you know, we use uh, diffusion models to project how fast an idea will spread through a community. So we're taking a very uh, large enterprise view and we just basically activate some kind of promotion and expect it will just flow, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it tends to be rather impersonal, uh, mass oriented. And so uh, what one appreciates about this Big Shots idea is it recognizes maybe the, in some cases, the hyper-local context that's required to speak to people where they are and how they are and that requires um, key individuals, mm -hmm. right? Key uh, domain-specific uh, folks. So interesting. Yeah. And uh, Tanja, any uh, what's your what's your take on, on on Big Shots? Can you tell us about your role in in it or related projects? Well, my main role in Big Shots is actually is um, helping put together a toolkit for um, use in it could be a COVID nineteen related vaccine campaign, but. Um, you can apply what we call the Big Shots method to really any issue that you want to address. It could be um, persuading people to get other vaccines. So if you were a college student and you wanted to um, start a campaign on your campus to um, increase HPV vaccination or meningitis B vaccination, you could use this toolkit and the Big Shots method to do that. You could, but you can apply it to really any issue. If you, think too many kids on your college campus are smoking. You could try a smoking cessation campaign using the Big Shots method. And it's really simple and straightforward and easy to apply to pretty much any issue where there might be people in your community doing good work under the radar and mm -hmm. you want to recognize what they're doing and hopefully get other people to see what they're doing and maybe want to do good things themselves. Okay, thank you. The, the, the interesting thing is, I want to give um, Lauren and, and a couple of people who have published this article in um, American Behavioral Scientists, another professor who co-leads the health communication for social change, Chris Palmetto and Ken Rabin, and we lamented even what this was called. I mean, mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time. We were able to get a grant from the CDC Foundation to do this, and we were able to get in-kind work from McCann, McCann Global Health to do really professional artwork that we looked at a lot of different ways of, of uh, what the logo would even look like. So it's a local spotlight. We had Carla Hill do in-kind uh, opening. So there is a, what, it's a little long, seven minutes, so we didn't show it today. Mm -hmm. But we have, we have videos, there's a bunch of other stuff that goes with it. Uh, and just wanted to say that these kind of pieces don't have traditional funders. It was easier, easier if I could say, to, to get a money funded to a survey. But 
doing the survey as a diagnosis. This is an idea, and as, as Brent, you're saying, if we're able to get the, that diffusion curve, of this, this goes from these early adopters to get that piece where we, we think it can catch on, but it's not meant to be a confetti or a thousand seeds and see which one. It's, it's also meant to have the elements that are there. So, you know, hopefully, this is a is a paper PDF description, but this lives somewhere. Maybe you want to talk mm -hmm. more about how it lives. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, so, BigShotsHeroes.org is our is our website, uh, and then uh, Big Shots Heroes uh, Instagram uh, handle. Uh, so we will have this uh, on our website uploaded shortly. Um, but it's really meant to be a ro a roadmap for anyone who who wants to to use it. Um, and like Tanja mentioned, you know it can be used by um, a student health. Um, department, it can be used uh, for issues that may have stigma attached to it, so that when we lift, we, we can lift some of that stigma with the stories of people who are who are doing you know great work and then hopefully inspire future big shots to do that work. Um, is there something else? No? I don't know if there are other. No. So just to, uh, we'll turn uh, maybe to the, to the rest of the room for uh, a little Q&A in a moment, but I'm, I'm curious, Scott. Uh, in terms of strategies for addressing any problem, you know, we all have seen every sector suffer uh, the habit of fighting the last war, strategizing for the last problem that we faced. So what are your thoughts in, in terms of uh, maybe the next time something happens sure. that we need to address? How do we, how do we make sure that people learn what it is they need to learn, that we identify the trusted, uh, confident sources, et cetera? Well, as, as I'm getting older, I, I get to live and live through more of these with, you know, I've done books on, on AIDS and HIV and bad cow crisis and written a lot of these things. But a couple years ago in the, um, when I was three years ago, the Emerson Blanc Carner meeting in, in Barcelona, they asked me to give a, a lecture with these different pieces. And some of the basic stuff that's on sort of one slide is our, our communication, I don't want to say pyramid, staircase, whatever it might be. We have to have appropriate public relations for those of you studying PR. We have to have highly targeted advocacy, whether it's media advocacy or policy advocacy. We have to bring in social marketing and have that targeted. We have to have good media relations and have the right pieces there. We have to aim for what in, in health, for a health literacy that people have the knowledge that they understand some basic numbers and basic probabilities. We need to build the, the same kind of understanding that we might call a health competent society. So it's easier said than done. Uh, I think the lessons, and I do believe, I mean, Fukuyama was quoted in the, in the last, um, last session. He has a whole book on trust. If you want to read a book on trust, I think trust is really the key. And if you look back, and you know, for, for those of you studying your rhetoric, right, Aristotle book two, right, the whole importance of trust and trustworthy sources, uh, that's where we need to build. And we are eroding it with our, our current media landscape, which we heard earlier today. We're eroding it with our current political landscape uh, with the hyperpolarization or even just polarization. So it, um, uh, it would have been nice to have heard the answer this morning in the keynote. There, mm -hmm. She didn't have the answer either. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping it's not a five or 10 year cycle. I hope it's a shorter cycle. We'll have to ask the political communication experts of Spencer and Susan's table. Uh, but I, I do think that there is, um, there's hope, but um, these dialogues are a part of it. But the trusted source uh, that uh, links to people where they, they um, get their information, and the social media is key. I mean, without thinking about the new technologies, and the last thing I'll just mention is just how, how quickly it's transformed. When I was working at USAID in 2000 in Washington, we said half of the world's population had never made a phone call. It's true. Half had never made a phone call. That didn't own a phone. Now we have twice as many phones as we have people on the planet. Mm. Almost, if you think of even Uvalde, these, they had phones. These kids had, elementary schools, kids have phones. So we have a totally different communication landscape. We have to figure out how to do a better job. And um, it's up to all of you. It's, and I didn't get more of these meetings. It's, it's the youth and all of you that are gonna make the difference. It's, it's, not, it's not us people giving lectures or publishing, if I can say as well. All right, so let's, uh, let's go to the room if we can. So I see a, a question from Al Jaffes. Do we have a microphone available there? All right, thanks. How long, how hard was it to fight the messaging of the other side during the pandemic? Uh, the anti-vaxxers, the disinformation on drugs, the when these 
besides emphasizing the great work of the hot, uh, the big shots, um, what else works in messaging against the misinformation? Well, it's a it's a super important question, and it's it's not just misinformation of lies that are promulgated. Uh, from people who don't know, it's also disinformation that lies that are promulgated by state actors. Right. Uh, so I think some of it has to be up to a, a very high level. Uh, nature communication, na nature has published, uh, and a lot of the people have done work on the networks, and the anti-vax and the misinformation drowns out the scientists and those that have the appropriate information. So we have to figure out a way, uh, one, to, I think in some ways we need to regulate against hate speech, if you want to call it hate speech, uh, if, it, if it's actually causing harm. Uh, I don't have the exact data on hydroxychloroquine, but I think when Spencer did the last poll on ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, we were shocked how many people were buying that in response to COVID. And we're trying to still figure out why that is, not just the US. So it's there. So what works? I'm, I'm, I'm going to open my phone because the piece that was published yesterday in, um, in Nature has sort of five things that works, getting public health authority, everything that we would know. So I, I'm not, it's not any new rocket science. It, the, the bottom line is we need to work together as all of society on it, and I don't have the right answer other than we need to increase the volume. And what I say in communication a lot, it's not just the message, and it's not just the messenger, but it's the dosage. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the dosage. We don't have the number of people and the, the number of, of um, venues to do that. On the other side, it is the messenger because when you have the free lead, the leader of the free world standing up at a podium in the White House talking about crazy, <laughs> you know, uh, cures for, for a pandemic. Um, it just makes it so difficult to do anything to cut through. If I, I think, can add, oh, add sorry. just a Go quick thought. Ahead. I Go think ahead. that we also, we've discussed this, Scott, that we're actually, and I'm sure we've all heard this, that we're, in the middle of two pandemics, right? The actual pandemic and then an infodemic, one of mis and disinformation. And I think that um, addressing mis and disinformation with the same seriousness as we would the actual virus is, is necessary. And I've you know, been thinking about this idea of literacy. You know, We need to address digital literacy, media literacy, and I think unfortunately now misinformation literacy. And we need to address the the root causes of why mis- and disinformation is so enticing for many people and what that, what those narratives fulfill. And then as public health messengers, we need to combat that a hundred times uh, you know, over because you can't unring a bell. And as I think we're all learning is once that information is out there, you can't erase it from people's minds. You can only arm them with the ability in the future to be able to identify harmful information, misinformation, disinformation. Yeah. So I know we have a, a question on the moment. Just going to take a moment. To, uh, I wanted to offer this. So I had a conversation with a, uh, a media psychologist yesterday, and we spoke about TikTok. Uh, and, and this expert shared with me that there are record numbers of individuals, mainly younger people, self-diagnosing mm -hmm. through social media and in TikTok in particular. And you know, as I see it, uh, in the not so distant future, we even have to think about the duration of messaging, right? How do you say something to someone relative to the appetite they have for receiving information? That's tough to do in 30 seconds. 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of cha channel changing rather rapidly, and that speaks to something Spencer mentioned earlier. Uh, much of how we've been trained in this room has not prepared us to deliver a message cogent and compelling in 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to marshal a variety of technologies and techniques. Uh, some of those are maybe emerging, but not yet emerged. Uh, so we'll have to be very, very creative, right, in ways, as you've mentioned, uh, that do not just involve facts and just the conventional playbook, per se. Yeah. Thank you. So just to let you know, with TikTok, the videos are longer than, um, thir than 15 or 30 seconds. You can, there's extensions oh, yeah. uh, on, yeah. 
Um, but it, my question um, is uh, regarding the Big Shots um, program. Um, how do you overcome technological challenges with access to the internet uh, when uh, your communication strategy is fairly um, social media based? Yep. So it's mostly social media, and then we have a website. Um, we partnered. With, well, for example, we partnered with the American College Health Association, and we chose Instagram. We chose Instagram because many of the college students were, were using it, and it's an easy platform for us to, to use. Um, in other communities that did not have as many um, people using social media or access to uh, to that, we partner with the people on the ground who are doing that. And so we amplify them in other ways to bring outside attention to bolster their presence. It's difficult because it's so specific. And so I think that Big Shots in a social media campaign is geared towards people who at least have um, access to or a familiarity with social media. And that's just one way. But if we can identify Big Shots in, in communities who are, who are going beyond that, that digital boundary, then how can we support them to bring eyes to them, to bring funding for them, to bring, to, to bolster that. So that's also, it's not just identifying on Big Shots, but identifying Big Shots to support them. Back to this issue of trust and communication and looking at people of diverse ethnic culture, in particular we look at the higher rates of infection and death rates with uh, black people as well as uh, Latinx, as well as Native Americans during the pandemic. How, what are you looking at as key areas of in communication to create trust in these communities when you're communicating that health message? In particular, when we look at in these communities, there's this underlying um, issue with trust internally of, of building trust orally, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the trusting the oral uh, traditions within these communities. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll answer that with, with two others since the title said Novel Communication Strategies. So I'm part of this Vaccine Equity Cooperative, which includes the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Association of Community Health Workers, a group called Health Leads out of San Francisco. It, it has a lot of small community groups working on different efforts. So we have the big policy pieces that we're articulating with the White House and up on the Hill that's not being done. But we're also trying to put it at the local level including the Native American voice and so forth. So that's, that's a national piece. Then we have a New York vaccine literacy campaign that was funded, which is very specific amongst communities. We actually have used uh, Emerson polling again for really understanding the Harlem community in East Harlem and doing also qualitative research on top of that. Why were women, Latinx, not get, or Latina, I should say, or not getting vaccinated while pregnant. So we actually recorded or filmed or used the right term these days, right? Uh, young women who are pregnant and why they got vaccinated in multiple languages, mostly Spanish, English, whatever, colloquial, and hope that connected. It is using mostly te technology, but we let them tell their story. So these are just two other ways. The Big Shots piece is still evolving, and I think what, what Tanja and, and Lauren have both said, it can, be, it can apply to any, any effort if this method uh, moves with hopefully in, a, in an ethical way, but, but does spotlight appropriately and, and ends up building trust by doing that with people that, peop that resonate with the target audience. Yeah, if I might chime in, um, you know, grow, growing up um, in a culture that values kind of uh, oral uh, transmission of information, right, of meaning, of all this stuff, uh, you know, when I, I remember when I was doing my dissertation, I got a, a quote that reflected what I was told as a child, communication is the glue that holds relationships together. And I'm also reminded of an earlier uh, talk up here um, on, on AAPI, that when we hear from people speaking on topics that don't relate to their ethnic identity, and we hear from, this, hear from them regularly on a wide range of things, then we appreciate them as everyday people. So when we have this consistency of valuing them as persons who say valuable things, it then makes it much easier for them to be trusted sources, right? Kind of like a griot in a community. Well, they're speaking. Everyone be quiet. So there are certain there are some things I believe that we uh, have been missing uh, for a while. They've always been there, but it's we know there have been hidden figures in every country, right? Um, but there are certain uh, traditions, many of them oral that should probably factor into the future. They don't move as fast. They don't move as rapidly. 
Uh, they don't get likes and subscribes per se on, on a, a big scale, but they get it at the proper scale for a given community. And so I think as, as we are more intimately in touch with um, things like that, we get messages that, that penetrate and that last. You know, when we talk about SDGs, sustainability really applies for anything that has value, right? So when we uh, maybe make SDGs relate to, say, oral tradition and the griots or whatever the equivalent is in different communities, we then always have a regularly identifiable source to reach out to. And the people that we want to ultimately hear from those people know that we value those people. So it's a, it's, it kind of helps us get to a flow state of information uh, exchange bi-directionally, not just one way. Oh, thank, you, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Greg. All right.